All right, let's go on to uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch. We've already been talking, uh, going for about an hour, so we don't want to go too much further, but we do want to cover this, and we're going to go quickly through it, so you'll come back to it. Uh, it's very heavy, very thick, but uh, it's very important. So this is a very, very close disciple of the Apostle and Evangelist John, a successor of the Apostles in the Sea of Antioch, one of the great first martyrs of the church, commemorated uh, throughout the church, a great figure, a great ecclesiastical figure, and he has his teachings, he has his letters, his epistles, and in that we have a very clear uh, doctrine of the church. Now, we're, we can't go into it very deeply. The paper that I would suggest you, you look at uh, is by Father John Romanides. It's online. It's the Ecclesiology of the St. Ignatius of Antioch. Father John Romanides here, he goes in depth, a beautiful paper, one of the most important papers on the topic, if not the most important in any language. Uh, so I'm going to be drawing heavily from Father John's uh, analysis. So there's a key presupposition here. The church exists for the sole purpose of salvation. Christ came to this world for one reason and one reason alone, to save us. The church saves us. The church exists for salvation. Whatever else has happened or happens in the church, around the church, and the and the fringes of the church that has nothing to do with salvation is not of the church. It's foreign. It's come in. People uh, call it churchly, but it's not of the church if it's not about salvation. The church is about salvation. So that's a presupposition here. First of all, in his teachings, we see that the nature, the human nature of God, that is of Christ, is none other than salvation itself. And we'll get into this later with a, a beautiful paper by uh, the former dean of the of the of the uh, uh, Theological School of Athens, uh, who fleshes this out in a, in a wonderful way, and we'll we'll look at that paper in future lectures. But the human nature of God is salvation. Very important. The restoration of immortality to those who partake corporately in selfless love. That's what that is. So immortality for those who partake of the Eucharist, he means, in this Eucharistic synaxis in the church. Salvation, the human nature of God, the salvation that comes, is the justification of man by the destruction of death and man's accuser, the captive, the captor uh, and captor of the devil. And it's the granting of the power to defeat the devil by struggling to attain a selfless love for God and neighbor through the flesh of Christ. This is all in his ecclesiology. What does this mean? That he has a Christocentric, even sarco, flesh. That means the Eucharist, sarco. Uh, logos sarx again, though. The word became flesh. This is the flesh that uh, is referred to in Scripture. This is the, uh, the flesh, as St. John the Chrysostom says, Christ took on the flesh of the church. So this is, this is very much uh, at the heart of, of, of Orthodox ecclesiology and, of course, the writings of St. Ignatius. Only the flesh and blood of the resurrected God-man are the source of life and resurrection of all men of all ages. That's where you become alive. Nothing less. No ideology. No mere teaching, the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ himself, the God-man. Number two, number second point, that we're, there's much, much more we could say. We're just taking a few major points. It is only by participation in the divine life and love of God in Christ through corporate love of neighbor that one may attain to immortality, be redeemed, and overcome death. So in the church, the corporate, that means the body of Christ, only by participation in the divine life, the Eucharist, and the presuppositions that, that, that need to be kept to become worthy of uh, partaking in the Eucharist. That goes without saying. That's a presupposition that's assumed. Uh, that's how one attains to immortality, redemption, and overcoming of death, spiritual death. Uh, all will be raised. But they will be raised, there will be those who raised under condemnation and judgment, and those raised into life. So, this Christocentric, sarcocentric uh, spiritual life, 
presented by St. Ignatius is not a luxury, it's not a theologumenon. We hear that today. It was a th people have theological opinions. I think this is my opinion on this. No, this, this, is, this, is, this is absolutely necessary. It lies at the very base of his ecclesiology. You cannot understand Orthodox ecclesiology if you don't understand this, the core of it, which is the Eucharist. And the presuppositions that lead to the Eucharist. I need to, we need to say that. Unfortunately, we have to say that today because there are people who treat the Eucharist outside of the context of the ascetic life. And of course, that's uh, impossible to, to understand that and enter into that. Now, this is the same vision that was there in the early church and in the New Testament. This is not just unique to St. Ignatius. Number three, through unity with each other in the love of Christ, Satan cannot prevail since love is the blood of Christ and eternal life by which the devil is destroyed. It's very interesting here in the writings of the early fathers and in the, in the saints of the church. They talk about the enemy. They talk about the demons. They talk about the devil. They talk about the, the, the war against him because that's why Christ came, man, to do away with the works of the devil. It, it, it is very indicative of apostasy from the Christian gospel and church when people don't talk about the wiles and the machinations of the enemy. That's not a Christian stance. That's not what the church does. It's very clear. And you cannot understand the, the incarnation if you don't understand the machinations of the enemy. So he says here in, in his writings, Take heed then often to come together to give thanks to God and show forth his praise. For when you assemble frequently in the same place, epito afto, Epitoafto, what is that? That's the Eucharist. That's the divine liturgy. When you assemble frequently in the same place, in other words, the Eucharist, the powers of Satan are destroyed. The destru and the destruction at which he aims is prevented by the unity of your faith. So again, we see the same thing again and again. What do we see? Orthodox faith, the Eucharistic assembly, unity therein, the Spirit of God, divine liturgy, Eucharistic synaxes. This is the core, with all the presuppositions that go into that. Again, again, he says another epistle, let no man deceive himself. If anyone be not within the altar, he is deprived of the bread of God. He therefore that does not assemble in the same place, epitofto, divine liturgy, has already manifested his pride and condemned himself. This is the test of whether you are a Christian, you are in the Eucharistic assembly, you're in, this is why this temptation that has come upon us in these latter days is so frightful and terrible. Never in the history of 2000 years has the church stopped the coming together in the Eucharistic synagogue. Right here, he's telling us, it is unacceptable to shut down the churches. It is totally unacceptable. It's unbelievable. The devil is having a heyday. Under no circumstances can a bishop or priest in good conscience shut the church down and drive people away. You are creating a, uh, committing a terrible offense and, and, and opening up the bowels of hell upon the earth. So there is no communion outside, brothers and sisters, outside the Eucharist. Epitofto, this is the visible church. There is no invisible church in the sense that people have it today in the Protestant, uh, mainly Protestant sense. It does not exist. The church is visible in this world. It's invisible. When we talk about the in invisible church, we, we mean the heavenly church, the church that is already uh, the victorious church. And we're going to get right into that right now. Number four, both the visible and invisible heavenly church constitute one continuous reality for St. Ignatius. Let me get Further down here, sorry. One continuous reality for St. Ignatius. The visible church, Saint Father John says, is composed of those baptized faithful who conduct an intense war against Satan. So it's not just enough to be baptized, chrismated, and commune once, twice, five times. You're at war. You're a Christian, you're at war against the enemy which wants to take you into hell. It's those faithful who are at war against Satan and the consequences of his power rooted in death by their unity of love with each other in the life-giving human nature.
nature of Christ. So his power is done away with, with that unity with each other in the life-giving human nature of Christ. Again, human nature of Christ is our salvation. And manifests his unity and love in the corporate Eucharist in which their very life and salvation is rooted. All right, so the baptized are those in the visible one and only church. There is no other church. There is no other baptism. They all together. There's no other mystery outside the mystery of the incarnation in the church. So the church has two aspects here. Very important. Very important to understand. We cannot just talk about one. We have to talk about both. The positive and negative. Positive, of course, is the love, the unity, the communion of immortality with each other and all the saints and then the, in, in Christ. And then there's the negative. And that's the war against Satan and his powers. They're already been defeated in the flesh of Jesus Christ by those living in Christ beyond death, awaiting the general or second resurrection, the final and complete victory over God of God over Satan. So there is a positive and negative. There's Christology and there's demonology. It's very interesting. We're going to get to the Second Vatican Council. Very interesting. Very, almost no references to demons and the devil in the Second Vatican Council texts. I don't remember exactly. It was very obscure. Neither heresy. That is a bad sign for those for that 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 the, those texts. But anywhere that's done, anywhere where Satan is not talked about, Satan does not exist. The devil does not exist. The demons does not exist. The 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 the, the passions don't exist. That's the end of spiritual life. There is no church is not there. You will not find the Church of Christ where that is not discussed. Christology is the positive aspect of the church, but is conditioned by biblical demonology which is the key negative factor which determines both Christology and ecclesiology. You want to understand the church? You want to understand Christ? You got to understand the negative factor as well, which is the demons, the demonology. What is going on? What is defeated? What was lost and why? And what is now defeated? What's been restored? All of that is connected. Both of which are incomprehensible. Christology and ecclesiology are incomprehensible without the adequate understanding of the work and methods of Satan. And then he quotes St. John, his epistle. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. For that's, that's why he came. And then you don't talk about why he came? You do away with that? You ignore that? Something wrong. The Eucharist is the formative and manifest center of corporate love unto immortality. The divine liturgy is the focal point of faith and action. It's the participation therein is in is the only sure sign of continuous communion with God and neighbor unto salvation. This unity of selfless love in Christ with each other and the saints is an end in itself. I'm going to repeat that. It's an end in itself, not a means to another end. That's it. Everything leads there. And this is a protection against what? The social gospel delusion. The church is at the service of humanity. We heard about that. The last 50 years since the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, but among even among some Orthodox hierarchs, they've fallen into delusion. It does not exist to prop up a dead and dying and decaying world that have turned away from Christ. We're not at the service of humanity, which is dead set in, 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 in going away from God. We're at the service to bring them to Christ, but not to serve their dying life their their so-called life in this world church doesn't come to that it comes to save people from that so there's no other end to the church the church ends and the meet the goal and the the purpose is unity in christ in the eucharist in the eucharistic synaxis because the fullness of christ is to be found in the eucharist which itself is the highest and only possible center and consummation of life of unity and love one community or local church cannot be considered but a part of another, much less inferior. This is going to go to the whole question of the local churches, uh, the hierarchy of the local churches, whether there's a primate, whether there's there's an infallible bishop, a, 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 a bishop with a jurisdiction. This here is going to go to that. This is the foundation which shows that whether where Jesus Christ is, I should say where, where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. What does that mean? Where the Eucharist is, 
where Jesus Christ is present. That's what that means. There is the church, the local church. What does that mean? That every local church has Christ in the Eucharist. So there's, there is no superiority. There's no one church over another. If you have the Eucharist, you have Jesus Christ. You're not lacking anything for someone else to have something more. All right, we'll get back to that later on. But that's a very key thing. So we should stress here that his ecclesiology also rules out some things. We're going to quickly go through these because this is important. We need to see the negative side. What, what is impossible to talk about? What, just a few things. What can we rule out as inadmissible as far as the church is concerned? All contemporary moralism and pietism is ruled out from his ecclesiology. Salvation apart from the reality of the Eucharist is ruled out. So moralism, pietism, salvation found in good goodwill and good works, uh, being a good person, none of that. None of that is in, in the ecclesiology of St. Ignatius or the, the Lord's or the Apostles or the early church. That's not what salvation is. You don't earn salvation. You don't attain salvation through good works or being a good person or being a moral person. That's not salvation. If that was the case, he didn't need to come. He could have stayed where he was and we could have gone on with the moral teachings of the Old Testament. So the saint implicitly rejects all moralisms and insists upon the absolute necessity of faith in the real historical facts of the incarnation of God from the virgin and of the death and the fleshly resurrection of the God man, the virgin birth and all the rest. So all those things are essential. You cannot talk about being a Christian. You cannot be a Christian and not have faith in that historical reality, that 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 scandal of the incarnation, that scandal of the rationalist mind. Number two, Christian ethics as a mere matter of preserving imagined, this is Father John talking, imagined innate moral laws of a supposed natural world for the attainment of personal happiness, whether transcendent or imminent. So all this talk of in the West of these uh, the laws of uh, moral laws and the natural world and all the rest that we're gonna what do we what do we need to do to become happy? It's not not present. It's ruled out. What is considered a natural quest for security and happiness? Remember the words of the Apostle Paul, when they, when they say peace and security, then the sword comes at the end of time, all right? So people are pursuing that as an end in itself, security and happiness, they are far from God. What is considered a natural quest for security and happiness is really a life according to the dictates of death of the, or the flesh dominated by death. Constantly seeking bodily and psychological security of existence and worth. Let no one, St. Ignatius, let no one look upon his neighbor after the flesh, but do you continually love each other in Jesus Christ? Love in Christ differs sharply from the katasarka, the according to the flesh, eudaimonistic and utilitarian love of so-called natural humanity. Number three. Moralistic doctrines of atonement, whereby man is already in possession of an immortal soul, so that salvation is merely a matter of changing the disposition of God. We need to change God's disposition to man. And then man toward God. By balancing the business interests of each are completely missing from the thought of St. Ignatius. Quoting Father John, Atonement is not a simple adjustment and rearrangement of divine and human psychologies. Neither is it an intellectual problem of identifying human concepts with the immutable prototypes of God's essence, which all together comprise truth. It is not the proper relationship of two immortalities, that of God and man, that is the stake, but rather the restoration of a lost immortality, now bound to death, and as a consequence morally corrupted. It is only by participation in the divine life and love of God in Christ through corporate love, that means the Eucharistic assembly, love of neighbors that one may attain to immortality, be justified, and avoid death. So this is the realism of 
the, of the gospel, right? You have to be in the concrete reality, the continuation and incarnation. People talk about this even among Orthodox, but they've been affected and affected by the heretical idea of that I can be a Christian alone. I can go and light my candle at a little chapel on the way, say my prayers, and I'm a good Christian. This is anathema to St. Ignatius. It's a delusion. If you're not there in the corporate Eucharist assembly, partaking of the flesh and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have no life in you. The Lord said it himself. You have no life in you. This is a delusion of many, though, today. Number four, abstract love and unity does not defeat the devil. Abstract, ideological, uh, platitudes, love, love that we talk about today, the love we, you see in the various movements and political, uh, certainly the fleshy love, not, not the love we're talking about here. So the, in, the love in the ecumenical movement, many times the kind of love they're talking about is not the love that we're talking about here. So abstract love and unity does not defeat the devil. Real unity in the Eucharistic assembly does. Only in the local synaxes of the faithful, by the unity of faith and love of real people living together in Christ. That's how it's defeated. Number five. The number's wrong here. There's no Christian life apart from the synaxis. Epito afto, the Eucharistic synaxis led by the bishops and priests and deacons. Beyond the life of unity centered in the corporate, corporate Eucharistic Eucharist as an end in itself, there is no church, and only God can know if there is any salvation. Where the church is not locally manifested and being formed by God, epito afto, there is the rest of humanity being carried to and fro by the peace, by the prince of the world. Let me read that again. Where the church is not locally manifested and being formed by God, epitofto, in the Eucharistic assembly and synaxis, there is the rest of humanity being carried to and fro by the prince of the world. I pray not for the world, the Lord says, but for them which thou hast given me. In other words, the disciples who come together and partake of his body and blood. That's those who have been given uh, to Christ. Now, the last section here, I'm calling it the scandal of the particular. We'll try to get through it as quickly as possible. We've run late. This first time, we've got a lot to cover. So next time, we'll, we'll, we'll shorten it and we'll have more questions. An abstract federation of communities whereby each body is a member of a more general body reduces the Eucharist to a secondary position and makes it possible for the, the, it makes possible the heretical idea that there is a membership in the body of Christ higher and more profound than the corporate life of love, local love for real people, not imaginary people on the internet, not people in Africa, but real people, and thus the whole meaning of the incarnation of God and the destruction of Satan in a certain place and a certain time in history is destroyed. It's a big sentence, but the point here is it's got to be face-to-face. It's got to be local. It's got to be in the Eucharistic synergy. That's where the destruction of the works of Satan take place. Each individual becomes a member of the body of Christ spiritually and physically at a special time and in a certain place. This sounds so basic, and yet so many people ignore this. They want to live a quote-unquote moral, quote-unquote Christian life in their head, pietistically, without the hard, fast reality of being submit, of submitting to Christ in a time and place, meaning the local parish, the local monastery, the local Eucharistic synesis, whatever it might be. And the way we're going, it's going to be more and more catacomb reality. Perhaps if God doesn't intervene, then, then not. So look, the incarnation and its continuation is a scandal to the rationalist. The same is true of the continuation of uh, the incarnation, the church. It's a scandal. Just as Christ walked upon the earth and was here and, the, and not there, and the people went and listened to him and were healed by him in a certain place and time, so too the body of Christ, the church, the continuation of the incarnation, walks upon the earth, is here and not there. And the faithful come together in the Eucharistic synergy, epitofto, to hear the word of God and to be healed within Christ. 
I've said this before, I'll say it again many times. There's nothing that they had. In fact, they had less those who lived with him and saw him and walked with him than those who live post-Pentecost. Those who live post-Pentecost are united by the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ in him and with one another. That did not happen until Pentecost. So in the church, nothing is lacking. Listen to what the apostle, and remember what the apostle uh, John, here it is, uh, wrote. Our communion with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, became possible by the Son's entrance into history. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands. The life was made manifest and we saw it. That which we've seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you may have communion with us. Pay attention. This is not just for the apostles. We, the saints, and in the lives of the saints, it's very clear that they see they touch, they hear, they walk and talk with Jesus Christ himself. Sometimes literally when they have visions of him, but spiritually in a daily basis, in prayer and in the Eucharistic synaxis. And it's nothing less than what anyone had while he walked on this earth.